Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on from when and where you are joining us. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to CDC Public Health Grand Rounds for August 2017, New Frontiers in Workplace Health. We have an exciting session, so let's get started. But first, a few housekeeping slides. Public Health Grand Rounds has continuing education available for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, veterinarians, health educators, and others. Please see our website for more details. We are also available on all your favorite web and social media sites. Please send your comments and questions to the Grand Rounds email box at grandroundscdc.gov. Want to know more? We also have a featured video segment called Beyond the Data, which is posted after the session. This month's segment features my interview with Dr. Getzel. We have also partnered with the CDC Public Health Library to feature scientific articles about safety and workplace health. The full listing is available at cdc.gov slash science clips, and we have follow-on articles with MMWR. Here is a preview of the upcoming Grand Round sessions. Please join us live or on the web at your convenience. And in addition to our outstanding speakers, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the important contributions of the individuals listed here. Thank you. And now for a few words from CDC's Deputy Director, Dr. Shuket. Thanks so much, Phoebe, and thanks to our speakers who've traveled in and um, uh, are ready to go here. I, um, I'm actually really excited about today's Grand Rounds topic and appreciate those who are here and those who are on Envision or on our um, internet uh, audience. Um, as I was thinking about today's topic, I realized that we've really come a long way, both as an agency and as a nation. Today's workers are much less likely to be killed on the job as they were 100 years ago. And today, many workplaces have become part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Within the span of my own career at CDC, we've gone from people smoking in their offices to designated smoking areas in the parking lot to housing a smoke-free and now tobacco-free campus. It was big news back in the day in the old Building One when they started piping in music in the stairwell. Now, of course, we have glass-enclosed beautiful stairwells and Tai Chi classes on campus and on and on. More than 153 million people are employed, and adults spend a huge amount of their, working of their waking time at work. That means that what happens at work can have a major effect on our health. Employers, of course, have a vested interest in a healthier and more productive workforce, and good employers value their workforce more than just for economic reasons. Here at CDC, I hope you know that we know that our staff are our most precious resource, and we also have some of the world's experts in prevention of complications from chronic diseases and on total worker health, which you'll be hearing more about today. Today's CDC has activities at, in the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, and we also fund centers of excellence that advance total worker health through research, intervention, outreach, and evaluation. You're gonna hear more about CDC's efforts as well as from leading academics in the field. Today's Grand Rounds gives up a, also gives us a chance to launch our Workplace Health Resource Center which, true to CDC's core values, will provide a wealth of high-quality evidence, including best practices, that can be used by employers and the public. We know there's more to do to promote health among our own staff and leadership here at CDC. Participate in a health and well-being council that is keen to assess our own policies and strategies. In the meantime, whether you work here at CDC or in state or local public health or other settings, I hope that today's Public Health Grand Rounds gives you healthy food for thought and that you take back to your own workplace ideas for how to help us not just talk the talk, but also walk the walk in terms of workplace health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shuckett. And now for our first speaker, Dr. Chooswood. Well, uh, good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's great to be with each of you. 
Uh, my job is to begin today the session uh, by exploring the important and emerging health and safety consequences of modern work. And I'll also take the opportunity to give you a little bit more information about the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program. Well, it's been said that the pace of change in our world is now happening faster than ever before. And it will never happen this slowly again. This is extremely true when we look at the world of work. The relationships between employees and employers are changing quickly. No doubt how we work and the way we work are dramatically changing. And we've got some important questions related to that. Are today's workplace health interventions adequate to keep pace? Can we actually design work itself to be healthier at the end of the day? These are some important questions that we're working to answer with our research. Certainly, technology is reshaping jobs, and in fact, full industries, and upending the relationships between the tasks we have and the jobs themselves. In fact, many traditional jobs that you have had in the past, or maybe your parents have had, are completely likely to disappear because of new workplace technology. It begs the question, will human workers even be necessary in the future new economy? Certainly autonomous big rigs like the one you see here with the driver who's actually using an iPad to play a game or watch a video. These are operating thousands of miles per month in the state of Nevada, already being shown to improve safety, decreasing stress and dangerous fatigues that drivers face. This is especially critical because the leading cause of workplace fatality in the country today and really much of the world is motor vehicle crashes. So an important way that technology is changing the nature of this work. Certainly other ways technology is changing work as well. The human machine interfaces that you see on this slide here are actually allowing us to do more faster, more powerfully, more quickly. The Navy's exoskeleton that you see on the right can reportedly increase ship production by 20%, reducing the number of workers needed to build ships. But actually very little is known about the long-term consequences of these new technologies. They certainly can make our lives easier, possibly safer, and add productivity to enterprises. But technology can also itself become a hazard. And it can lead to injury in and of itself or create unrealistic expectations of workers, decrease their agency, intensify work demands, and actually decrease their day-to-day -day control. Despite emerging technologies, many workers also still have very traditional jobs, like some of the ones you see here. These are oftentimes manual work, low-tech jobs, oftentimes repetitive, with very low levels of day-in, day-out control, minimal decisional latitude, and little or no flexibility. And unfortunately, many of these jobs continue to expose workers to physical hazards, violence on the job, punishing schedules and shift work, and certainly work-associated stress continues to be epidemic in many of these settings. Additionally, economic patterns are changing, redefining the very way we are employed. Take a look at this quote. My father had one job in his life. I, likely to have six in mine, but my kids are gonna have six at the same time. Wow. That some may benefit from those changes, but a lot of folks will not, because we know that this has a price to pay. Certainly the intermittency of employment, the decrease in security or the promise of a long-term job can certainly lead to stress, to uncertainty and interrupted earnings over time. Some, as we mentioned, will benefit from the freedom or mobility of this new pattern of employment. But we see worrisome safety, health, and societal consequences in these new work arrangements. Certainly, employer-based health insurance, so critical to our enjoyment of life and longevity, is missing in many of these non-standard work arrangements. 37% of temporary workers have jobs in hazardous industries like manufacturing or construction. And our research shows that contingent workers have twice the risk of on-the-job injuries compared to those in standard employment. Safety equipment and training are oftentimes lacking or inadequate. We also know that costs of injuries are more likely to be shifted to vulnerable workers themselves or perhaps to the public at large when there's no responsible party who's named the actual employer. So just how common are these new work arrangements? Let's ask this question. Between 2005 and 2015, what percentage of net employment growth within the U.S. economy actually occurred in these non-standard work arrangements? And here you can see some of those examples 
of what is termed non-standard work. Would it surprise you that that number is 94%? Between 2005 and 2015, 9.4 million new workers entered work in alternative work arrangements compared to only 400,000 in what is termed standard work. It's a dramatic shift over this last decade in how we are actually employed. Beyond the work arrangement or the nature of employment, both in old jobs and new ones, it is actually hazardous working conditions that drive the health burden that many workers face today. And of course, this varies widely across industry and occupation, but about 12 to 13 workers will die on the job today, and an additional 150, or about 10 times as many, will actually die of a work-related illness. Emerging insights are also beginning to reveal that this number actually may only be the tip of the iceberg. So let's take a deeper look. In the past, we have thought of workers bringing the risks of chronic diseases with them to work and using workplace health promotion programs to help them manage these chronic diseases. But in truth, the opposite is also true. The conditions that workers face on the job itself actually contribute to chronic disease risks, and those are a take-home benefit of far too many jobs. Our research shows a growing link between work and cardiovascular disease and cancer. Up to 20% of cardiovascular deaths are thought to be work-related among the working age population. And up to 8% of all cancer deaths are caused by work-related carcinogens. This number is far higher in men and certainly in cancers like bladder cancer and lung cancer. New surveillance is also showing that some jobs are just downright obesogenic. Police officers, firefighters, and security guards are more than 50% more likely to be obese than the typical American worker. Now, some people say, well, this is because of the sedentary nature of the job or their dietary habits, but our research shows that it's more at play than that. Shift work, long hours of work, high stress levels, constant scrutiny, having to make split-second decisions, these all drive cofactors that lead to the risk of obesity. Low-wage healthcare workers and transportation workers also uh, fare poorly. So I'll have a question for you. Should the profession that someone chooses automatically condemn them to a shorter lifespan with a greater risk for disability and an early death? We think there's a better way. So with these challenges looming, we're looking at a new concept for greater safety and health that keeps pace with the changes that our society is facing. To help meet this challenge, NIOSH launched the Total Worker Health Program in 2011 to champion a broader, more holistic approach to workplace health. We focus on programs, practices, and policies at the organizational level that first seek to keep workers safe. And beyond that, don't stop there, establishing additional programs, practices, and policies that improve health and support prevention, with the goal at the end of the day of improved worker well-being. And you see those workers that go home with more health at the end of the day, they bring it back the next morning in the form of decreased injury risk, better engagement, more fulfilling work, more enjoyable work, a stronger desire to contribute to something greater than themselves. They also have decreased health care spending, more productivity, and the organizations can thrive economically as well. So what do these programs, policies, and practices look like? Here you can see a number of them. We invite you to take a look at our national agenda here and our website for more. But basically, we're giving workers a voice in how they do their work, giving them more control, more flexibility, paying attention to benefits, wages, and work-life interface. We believe it's hard for a traditional workplace wellness program that just focuses on health promotion to adequately overcome 8, 10, 12 hours a day of harmful working conditions. The trick is to improve the quality of the work itself. That in and of itself can be a powerful intervention for better health. We've launched an, a number of new research activities, and here are some of the questions that we're hoping to answer in our progress. So how can jobs be redesigned or recrafted to create better health? How can we target interventions that we know are leading to poor health outcomes and chronic diseases like harmful schedules, stress, unhealthy supervision? How can we better show the value of these kinds of interventions and convince employers that this is worth the money? What are the long-term health consequences 
of the new work arrangements, the non-standard work that we've been describing? What aspects of work increase our risk for chronic disease and what can we do about it? And can we reach the holy grail of not only having work make a living, but contribute to a better life? We rely on a number of centers and affiliates across the nation to help us do our work within the NIOSH Total Worker Health Program. Here you can see six centers of excellence that are regionally located to primarily do basic research in total worker health. And then we have a network of 27 affiliates that help with the development of best practices and toolkits and serve as test beds for interventions so that we can each learn from a variety of workplace settings, industries, and occupations. In short and in summary, I believe that none of us should exchange wages for health. Work is changing, and our workplace health interventions must change to meet this challenge. It's time for seeing work as an opportunity for both a better living and a fuller, healthier life. Thanks very much for your time today. Now we'll hear from Ron. Thank you, Casey, and thank you very much. I'm honored, delighted to be here today. Thank you, Phoebe Thorpe, for organizing this meeting, uh, Casey Chosewood, Jason Lang, everybody at CDC who made this day possible. I think it's a big event to be focusing on workplace health promotion. My topic today is a business case for investing in workers' health and well-being, and we'll start with the definition of what is workplace health promotion. These are employer initiatives. They're sponsored by employers directed at improving the health and well-being of workers, and in some cases, their dependents. It goes by other names as well, wellness programs, well-being programs, health and productivity management, health enhancement, demand management, and as Dr. Chosewood noted, total worker health, which is a combination of health promotion and occupational health and safety. So first question, of course, is what is the prevalence of these workplace well wellness programs, and you'll be surprised to hear, based upon a study from the Kaiser Family Foundation released last year, that about four out of five large employers, those with about 200 workers or more, say that they have workplace wellness programs that help employees lose weight, get them to quit smoking, provide lifestyle behavioral coaching, and about a third of them also provide incentives for their workers to participate in these programs. So four out of five, however, our research, published this year, this is based upon Nielsen survey data, says that only about 13% of those employers actually provide comprehensive health promotion programs that are bound to improve the health of the workforce and impact the financial performance of that workforce. So here are the five components from Healthy People 2010. Even though four out of five employers say that they offer wellness programs, if you survey employees who are workers fewer than half say that their employers offer these programs to them. So there's a big a gap there, a disconnect between what employers think they're offering and what employees are actually experiencing. But if those work, workplaces do offer these wellness programs, more than half, 55% of the workers say, we participate in these programs when they're offered. So here is the very uh, stereotypical chief financial officer that you often face. And you, you're in front of this man and you say, well, we want you to invest in the health and well-being of our workers. And he or she turns back to you and says, wait a minute, convince me that's a good idea because I'm already paying a ton of money on health care and health insurance for treating disease. So how do you respond to that? Well, here's the logic flow. Here, here are the arguments. Number one, we know that modifiable health risk factors, any, anywhere from sedentary lifestyle, poor eating habits, tobacco use, high alcohol consumption, not going to your doctor for preventive screening, these are precursors to a large number of diseases and premature death. Tens of thousands of studies document that. Secondly, a lot of studies in the business literature show that these modifiable health risk factors are associated with, with increased healthcare costs and diminished worker productivity. Thirdly, there's good evidence out there that you can move population health through evidence-based workplace health promotion programs. And if you move population health, the cost will follow in, in the form of reduced costs and improved worker productivity. And final point here, there's also a potential for savings in terms of reductions in healthcare costs and improvements in absenteeism, and even in some cases, a positive return on investment or a positive ROI. 
So there have been controversy about whether these workplace wellness programs work, and the answer is many of them don't work because they don't apply evidence-based practices. This is an article we published in 2014. Uh, myself and 21 other authors had asked the question, do these workplace wellness programs work? And our answer was it depends, depends upon whether you apply best practices. Now, a lot of our work was based upon systematic review done here at the CDC by the Community Guide Task Force and the staff of the Community Guide. This is a review, systematic review of workplace health promotion programs done over 20 years. And the, this review found that these programs can have a positive impact on behavioral risk factors, biometric risk factors, and also those statistics that are important to employers, productivity of the workforce, and healthcare utilization. A parallel review was done by three Harvard economists, Baker, Cutler, and Song, that looked at these workplace wellness programs, again, over two decades, and came to the conclusion that, indeed, these programs can generate savings, somewhere around a three-to-one return on investment in medical and an additional three-to-one return on investment on absenteeism costs over a three-to-five-year time horizon. We've done a lot of studies of individual companies and looked at the performance of these companies and whether they're able to move the needle on population health and achieve a positive ROI, and the answer has been yes. Studies with Highmark, with Johnson & Johnson, IBM, Citibank, Dow Chemical, Procter & Gamble, just some examples of the published literature out there. Large populations, tens of thousands of people over many years demonstrating a positive health and financial impact from these programs. However, I warn you, don't overpromise. I suggest that you promise a one-to-one -one ROI. That is, for every dollar invested, you get a dollar back. But the main caveat here is you have to demonstrate that that program has had measurable impact on population health. It actually has improved the health and well-being and safety of your workers. Uh, there are a number of interesting studies just published last year that looked at the performance of companies that have exemplary workplace health and safety programs and how their stock price has performed over time. This is an example of one study that we did looking at the winners of the C. Everett Coop Award, which has been around for over 20 years. We looked at companies that received the award from 1999 to 2014. Here's a listing of those companies that are publicly traded and then looked at their stock price compared to the S&P 500. And you'll see that these, this portfolio of 26 companies outperformed the S&P 500 by about three to one. You would have earned 325% return on your investment had you put your money on these 26 companies over these 14 years. Now, the challenge is, of course, to get the word out to let all the companies in America find out what these companies have done to improve health, save money, and improve their stock performance. So we are disseminating information today. You'll hear from Jason Lang about our newly launched CDC Workplace Health Resource Center and how it works. But there are other sites out there that provide guidebooks, how-to guides, playbooks, and really excellent case study examples of companies that have done this very well. So what is the secret sauce to success? We've done benchmarking studies over the last uh, two decades or so, and we've gone out and visited these companies. This is a long list. This is kind of a top 10 list of success factors. I won't go through uh, all of them, but on top of everything is establishing a culture of health. So it's not just a program, but it's something that's part of who you are, the climate, the organization, the culture, where you work. One CEO referred to uh, this as, I want my employees to be healthier and safer when they leave the office in the afternoon than when they first came in. Obviously, you need to have very strong leadership commitments, strategic plans, goals, objectives, budgets, engagement of workers, and then at the bottom of the list, measurement and evaluation. You want to make sure that the kinds of goals and objectives you put in place are actually being achieved and that it's being reported back on an ongoing basis. So in summary, workplace health promotion programs do work if you do them right. There are three categories of outcomes that are important, financial outcomes, health outcomes, and what I would call humanistic outcomes. In the financial area, return on investment, you can find that in terms of medical cost savings, absenteeism, short-term disability, safety, workers' comp, and presenteeism, on-the-job productivity gains. Health outcomes need to be connected back to this. So adherence to evidence-based practices, documenting behavior change, risk reduction, health improvement. And then finally, quality of life and productivity outcomes, the value on investment. 
improve functioning of workers and their performance, attraction and retention of talent, people who want to work for the employer of choice in the community, engagement in people's jobs because they, they feel the company really cares about them, demonstrating corporate social responsibility, and enhancing corporate, corporate reputation, which may, by the way, influence your stock price. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I'll turn it over now to Laura. Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and on this panel today. Health departments are responsible for ensuring the public's health, including the health of employed individuals, and they're uniquely positioned to help promote, monitor, and regulate the health and safety of workers. The purpose of our study was to assess the current activity level and capacity of state health departments for both occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion. We also identified strategies for improving health department capacity in these areas. This project was a collaboration between investigators from the Workplace Health Research Network funded by CDC. We used a mixed method study design, specifically an online survey followed by in-depth interviews. Individuals identified as most knowledgeable about occupational safety and health or workplace health promotion in each state or territory received the online survey. Response rate for the survey were 70% for occupational safety and health and 71% for workplace health promotion. In-depth interviews were completed with 14 occupational health and safety specialists and 13 workplace health promotion specialists. We interviewed health departments with a broad range of activities as well as those with few activities. First, we asked, what activities are health departments most likely to be doing? We asked about several types of activities. Today, we'll report on three. Surveillance activities, which included what departments are doing to track workplace illness and injury, as well as the prevalence of worksite programming in their state. Activities to help employers implement programs, such as educational materials and tools, training programs, technical assistance, and or quality assurance programs, and direct services provided to workers. Survey results showed that occupational safety and health programs were most active in surveillance, with 67% reporting a moderate to high number of surveillance activities, which is not really surprising since 26 health departments get funding from NIOSH to do occupational safety and health surveillance. Most common surveillance activities included tracking occupational lead levels in adults, compiling, analyzing, and interpreting the occupational health indicators, as an example. Workplace health promotion respondents were most active in providing implementation support to employers, with 60% providing all four types of support, including educational materials such as sample breastfeeding policies, trainings, technical assistance with the CDC worksite health scorecard, and or quality improvement activities such as creating state wellness awards. More than half of all respondents reported that they provided direct service to workers. Next, we work to understand more about the capacity that health departments have to carry out occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion activities. We report here on four selected types of capacity to conduct these activities. Dedicated funding and staffing over the past year, organizational support, and staff competency to do these activities. Funding and staffing for both activities were relatively low. Occupational safety and health respondents reported a median of 150,000 of funding over the past year, while workplace health promotion respondents' median funding was about one-third of that. 19% of occupational safety and health and 30% of workplace health promotion respondents said that their department had no funding at all for these activities. Both occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion respondents reported a median of about one FTA of staffing being engaged in these activities over the past year. In terms of organizational support, as shown in the left two charts, a majority of respondents felt that their departments were just slightly or moderately committed to occupational safety and health or workplace health promotion activities. On the right, you see the majority of respondents felt that these activities were a low to moderate priority for their department. Then we asked, how can capacity for occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion be increased? Respondents gave concrete suggestions about how to improve existing funding for these type of activities. 
occupational safety and health respondents suggested that CDC should allow states to respond to emerging hazards by giving more flexibility in how funds are spent, reduce the number of application requirements for the current NIOSH state occupational health and safety surveillance program, and focus that grant more on practice and less on research. Workplace health promotion respondents requested more resources for administration and grant management and more stability in funds from year to year. We repeatedly heard from respondents like this one who noted there are no staff to deliver or coordinate this work. There's always got to be someone on point coordinating something of this magnitude. And if it's an important issue, it needs resources. We also asked respondents how to best improve staff competency to do this work. Workplace health promotion respondents valued tools that could be used to train staff, such as the CDC Health Scorecard and Workplace Health Promotion website. And occupational sa safety and health respondents mentioned the value of the CSTE occupational health indicator how-to guide, particularly for newcomers to the field. Both occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion respondents also valued accessible and specific trainings that are low cost, available online, and open to community partners. Workplace health promotion respondents indicated they wanted more training on how to make the business case, while occupational safety and health respondents requested more training in various areas of occupational epidemiology. Respondents also valued and wanted more opportunities for peer learning, especially from other states. Detailed case studies would be helpful, as we hear from this respondent. Respondents believed that a fundamental change would be needed to see a real increase in state health department's capacity for doing occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion activities. Specifically, efforts need to be fully integrated into the state health department mission and other activities. For example, when addressing infection control, including occupational safety and health professionals who know the most about personal protective equipment as part of these public health teams. Respondents felt that such collaborations could help health department leadership see how occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion contributes to the agency goals, which would lead to increased support, funding, and better coordination of services. Respondents gave concrete suggestions about what the CDC could do to promote integration. For example, require that other streams of funding that come to health departments carve out a component for worker health or incentivize integration by encouraging collaboration during the grant writing process. And another way to promote integration is to include industry and occupational indicators in other major surveillance programs, such as the cancer registries, the pregnancy risk assessment monitoring system, or as part of BRFSS. This would give health departments the data they need to understand how work impacts priority health outcomes in the state. And, do more to communicate that occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion are core public health domains, including CDC saying that work-related health is an essential part of health department work. Finally, we explored whether or not health departments are involved with the total worker health strategies that Dr. Chosewood introduced you to earlier. Unfortunately, 54% of workplace health promotion respondents and 16% of occupational safety and health respondents reported that they were not at all familiar with total worker health. However, more than half of our respondents reported that they have collaborated with each other, which is promising for the idea of expanding total worker health in health departments and increasing capacity in the future. Currently, most of these collaborations are at a fairly moderate to very low level, as you see highlighted in yellow here. In summary, we believe these selected national survey results have some important implications for practice and can lay the foundation for future work. We learned that reported activity levels for both occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion was fairly high despite relatively low levels for, of funding and staffing. Not surprising due to current funding patterns, occupational safety and health was doing more on surveillance and workplace health promotion and implementation supports to employers. There is a need for more funding and staffing, to be sure, but respondents offered many other great ideas for increasing capacity and commitment. For example, make training accessible and tailored to new and existing staff needs, include industry occupational indicators and other surveillance programs, include the expertise of occupational safety and health and workplace health promotion professionals on all public health teams, and support and incentivize integrated total worker health initiatives at all levels and in all funding opportunities. 
Thanks to all the health department participants who responded to our survey and interviews, to our Workplace Health Research Network collaborators, and to you for your attention. Now we'll hear from Jason. Thank you, Laura. It's truly an honor and privilege to be a part of today's uh, Public Health Grand Rounds, and I'm happy to be able to introduce to you all for the first time CDC's new Workplace Health Resource Center. As you've heard today, workplace health programs are a business and public health opportunity, but there's a gap between the evidence of what we know works and getting the right programs put in place. Two national nonprofits, the Partnership for Prevention and the Bipartisan Policy Center, helped lay the evidence out for this. The first report in 2008 and then the second in 2013 described evidence-based promising and best practices information and made recommendations. They showed real issues expressed by employers, including barriers such as lack of knowledge about how to start a program or how to build it, and concerns about the difficulty in implementation. For small employers who often have lower capacity and fewer resources than larger employers, these barriers are particularly sensitive. They also listed a number of opportunities to leverage the worksite setting that could make it easier to implement, sustain, and achieve population health impacts for working adults, such as using established systems like the organization's policies and procedures and its broader culture to integrate health-promoting norms and programming into daily work. With this potential to impact so many people, these gaps and barriers deserve public health's attention. Both organizations encouraged educating employers about the value of workplace health promotion and how many of the existing tools and resources could be improved and better leveraged to help employers with the design, implementation, and evaluation of their workplace health programs. They encouraged developing a clearinghouse website with reliable information on workplace health programs, including lay summaries of study results and tools to help employers estimate the cost of implementing a program at their work sites. They believed a well-designed centralized clearinghouse could overcome many barriers. This one conclusion from the Bipartisan Policy Center report summed it up quite well. Quote, while some employers may believe that health improvement and risk reduction programs exert a positive effect, they may not know how to design and implement successful programs or determine which program elements are effective. Thus, they need guidance from trusted sources so that they can replicate interventions shown to be effective. CDC has acted on this recommendation. I am pleased to announce that today, CDC is launching its newest workplace health offering, the CDC Workplace Health Resource Center, also referred to as the WHRC. This easy to navigate website helps employers find actionable workplace health information, guidance, and tools to develop or expand their workplace health promotion programs. The WHRC is your first online stop to advance workplace health promotion through employer education. The WHRC includes reliable, credible, fact-based resources from organizations already in the workplace health marketplace. The public information is vetted by the CDC and a steering committee of national experts in the workplace health community, including employers, state public health departments, business health associations, and academic institutions. The WHRC helps employers tailor workplace health promotion programs to suit their organizational needs. Currently, the WHRC database has over 200 resources, and that list will continue to grow over time. The free uh, website will include or does include case studies with real life examples from organizations of different sizes. Since we know employers really respond to seeing examples of what their peers and competitors are doing and have done. Emerging health issues, the WHRC has identified a number of gaps in available public domain information on a number of topics such as sleep and fatigue. Over the coming year, we will be developing a set of new novel products to address some of these issues. The website will include new evidence-based summaries and issue briefs on a range of topics. Uh, one of the first out of the gate will be on total worker health, which you've heard about this afternoon. 
These are aimed at presenting complex scientific findings in terms employers are familiar with and can take action on. Videos and webinars are available to train and help organizations who may not know where to start their program, expanding the type of communication channels we are using to reach and engage employers. And we will have a special emphasis on workplace health strategies for small business. Why a special emphasis on small employers? Because small employers represent over 99% of all employers, and in terms of their use of effective workplace health interventions, lag significantly behind their larger counterparts. For example, only 56% 50 of businesses with less than 200 employees offer health insurance coverage, and of those, only a third offer chronic disease and health promotion programs such as tobacco cessation and weight management for their employees. Focusing on underserved small employers is not just emphasized for the WHRC, but for CDC's larger workplace health promotion program as well. Users can find information by organizational or employer and individual or employee factors. The organizational factors take a broad and comprehensive look at the critical foundational elements of managing and implementing a program that will set it up for success and long-term sustainability. The individual factors are also holistic as they expand beyond just issues of physical health, like physical activity and diet, and include other dimensions of wellness, such as mental, emotional, and financial health. The WHRC uses the CDC workplace health model to categorize and organize its content. The model has four steps to help employers develop or expand a workplace health promotion program and incorporates the, org incorporates the organizational and individual factors described earlier, starting with an assessment of employer and employee needs, interests, and health risks that moves into a planning process to lay out the program's goals and objectives, garner leadership support, and build an infrastructure to manage the program, followed by implementation of evidence-based interventions from employee-level education and skill building to policy and environmental support strategies to change the broader working environment for everyone, and concluding with an evaluation addressing key employer interests such as healthcare costs and worker productivity. In addition to targeting small employers, the WHRC aims to support a wide range of those interested in starting or expanding workplace health promotion programs, such as human resources and benefits managers and wellness champions, and employers of all types and sizes, brokers and healthcare benefits consultants who help businesses choose the most appropriate health insurance coverage for their needs, including wellness programs, state public health departments, and business health coalitions. I'd like to thank the following team leads and all their staff, in addition to the staff from the uh, Grand Rounds office and my fellow panelists. If not for all the folks' contributions here, we could not have gotten the WHRC up and off the ground uh, for today's launch. Please visit our website and become familiar with this new resource. You can also stay connected by following us on various social media channels as we add more content to our database. Thank you very much. And this concludes the presentation segment. We'll now move to Q&A. And um, for folks in the room, if you want to gather by the mics, and as you do that, I'll throw this over to Susan, who will open up for any online questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. We're waiting for online questions at this time. I would encourage everyone that's watching online, take advantage of this opportunity to ask your question from this panel. It, that would be grandrounds at cdc.gov, or you can post to Facebook Live. Got one in the room? All right, great. 
Oh, thank you, Jason. Uh, great job. Very interesting discussion. Um, I was particularly intrigued by the statistic that 94%, I guess, of uh, workers are new jobs, are created in alternative work environments. And as many of you on the panel are perhaps aware, CDC is certainly among those who have embraced alternative work environments. There's been a, a real push toward hoteling, for example, within our center and the chronic disease center. And I think it raises the question then about the division between workplace and the general environment. And at a minimum, it would seem that that, that relationship is becoming much more porous. So when you talk about workplace health promotion, um, my question the question is, when you look at some of the leading causes of death, and I happen to work on one of those, which is alcohol, um, the, a lot of the factors that are major drivers of smoking behavior, drinking behavior, exercise, food, are in the environment, in the community, outside of the workplace. So it's great to talk about what, the, what can be done in the workplace, but clearly it seems like a lot of the action is going to come from employers getting engaged in trying to improve the health of the community where they're located. So my question then is, to what extent, under the guise of total worker health, are you seeing employers get more engaged in trying to really make positive changes in the communities where they're are located, and does that also open up then some opportunities for greater collaboration with health departments? It's an excellent question, and completely agree with you that the porous boundary between work and home has never been greater. Uh, my guess is that the majority of you do a considerable amount of work at home already, either with a smart device or actually logging on or teleworking a certain portion of your day. Mm -hmm. So it is increasingly important for us to think broader than just the walls of the workplace when we're concentrating on health opportunity, health trajectory for workers. Increasingly, employers also, especially in some industries, are competing for workers with high mm -hmm. levels of skills. So the more flexibility they offer, the better in keeping workers on the job and, and satisfied. Workers that certainly can take advantage of work away from the walls of the workplace have health benefits as well. So we see a lot of promise in this opportunity and it makes sense for employers to have a focus beyond the walls of the workplace, to look at the health of the community mm -hmm. as very much reflective of where they will draw healthy workers from. Mm -hmm. So there really is a built-in incentive for them to be supportive of community health interventions. Uh, I'd like to ask if any other panelists have something to contribute. Yeah, I, uh, Bob, yeah, I've got some comment on that as well. I agree with you. Uh, most employers are still primarily focused on their workforce, but as Casey just mentioned, mm -hmm. the pool of workers is the community. Mm -hmm. and they're going to get healthy or unhealthy people in the community, so they actually have a stake in improving the health of their communities. We're in the middle of a project now which is funded by Robert Johnson Foundation that is looking at internal and external cultures of health, what employers are doing to improve the health of the workforce, which there are a lot of scorecards out there and they're pretty good metrics. Mm -hmm. On the external stuff, there's very little out there. We've actually developed a, a scorecard for what employers can be doing. One of the first places to look at is corporate social responsibility efforts mm -hmm. in the community, and those are telling about what, whether the employers are reaching out to the community to improve the health in, in those places that workers are spending much of their time. Great. Thanks. I'll just add one actual comment. I think it's an opportunity for state health departments who have expertise in community health and uh, work with the community on a regular basis to actually partner up with employers to do this work. I think it's, it's one of the best times in our history for this to actually be um, bringing people to the table. So I really appreciate your question and I think it's um, you know, very much a follow-on to the data that I was presenting in terms of um, where health departments are with this issue. Susan, you got a question online? They're starting to come in, yes. Uh, from Janice, what I'm seeing is a need to assist some organizations in getting support from both the C-suite and the middle-level manager. How does your new offering help? I assume you're talking about the uh, Workplace Health Resource Center. Yeah, much of the content in the uh, new database and a lot of the products that will be developed um, are aimed kind of at the sweet spot of the practitioner who is charged with or responsible for the management, implementation, or oversight of the program. Now, there are tools within the database that help that individual communicate up about the importance, the value, um, how to evaluate metrics, um, what the programs are capable of and how they'll play out, which would be for the benefit of leadership 
in the companies, financial officers, presidents, vice presidents, et cetera. There's also information to help that individual, again, in the, in the middle, communicate information down to frontline employees to help them to get awareness built, engagement built, and ultimately participation in the programs and changes to their behavior. So um, there are things in there aimed at that audience, but most likely through an intermediary who is going to be uh, working day to day on these kind of programs. For me, that question really sparks this importance of having uh, this spotlighted at every level of management. We oftentimes say that in small businesses, if you have an owner or an operator who's really charged with this and who really feels excited about it, you can have a very easy path to full implementation. But if you have organizations where there's not frontline management support, it really doesn't matter what the leadership says. So you really need support for these interventions at every level. Oftentimes it isn't your private physician who has more to say about your long-term health, it's your frontline supervisor who has so much of that control. Yeah, one more thing to add. A lot of leaders who believe in this are looking for hand-holding. They need a script, they need ideas, they need direction, uh, they need tasks. Uh, they need to be told what to do, what to say, how to say it, and how many resources ought to be dedicated. So this is the kind of information, the tools and resources that the website can provide to the internal champion so that they can supply that to their leadership. I just want to put a plug in for getting employees involved in this because a lot of intervention work actually can work from the employee up as well as from top management down. And so I think the opportunity to engage with employee wellness committees and safety committees that actually have a vested interest in what's happening in the workplace, they often will be the champions of these programs in their organization and can really be a force for change. Um, so we need resources for those middle line managers and line supervisors to make a real difference in these workplaces because I totally agree that top management is um, really important, but without middle management and supervisors allowing you to participate in these programs when they are available to you, it makes it extremely challenging to have the positive impact we know that we can have with these programs. Uh, I have another question in the room. Hi, Dekeely Hartsfield from the Office of the General Counsel. Hello, Casey. I know you've been working on this issue for a while within NIOSH, and I, I had a question about whether there has been a change in the receptivity about the importance of total, total worker health now that there's been more of an evidence base in regards to the business case for, for working towards those efforts. And then secondly, has there been any differences or are there any differences in the different industries that have been more receptive to this message and are the more hazardous industries you know, acknowledging, you know, this issue or has it been, you know, other industries that don't look at occupational safety and health issues as, as much as others? Thanks, Dekeely. Those are excellent questions. And it, it really has been, I think, early interest from many of the large employers where they had additional resources and they were probably tracking their metrics of healthcare spending and some of their, you know, internal surveillance around occupational illness and injury more closely. So that represented some of the first area of great interest. We're also seeing a lot of interest now in those jobs that are actively competing for workers, that are actually having to build a better portfolio of workplace offerings to attract and retain usually a very talented workforce. Additionally, though, we're putting an emphasis on the value of these kinds of interventions in the most hazardous work or in those areas where workers have few opportunities. Think those that are in the service industry, lower wage, low opportunities for, you know, maybe even accessing health in the community or in other settings. So for us, we're trying to emphasize that there's value in this for every industry, every occupation, workers in, in you know, organizations of every size and certainly at every wage. You have another one, Susan? We sure do. Lisa asks, what resources are going to be put in place to evaluate and help states implement an infrastructure to provide adequate support to businesses? Money's one start, but states need to multiply their efforts through local public health chambers anywhere that has a good relationship with business. <laughs> I can actually start, and um, I would love to hear from others who have funding uh, to offer. Um, no, I think there's a lot of ways that we learn through our uh, national survey and talking sort of through, especially through the in-depth interviews, that um, we learned that state health department, uh, whether it was occupational safety and health or workplace health promotion, 
Um, they're acknowledging that it's always important to have more staffing and more funding. But the reality is, and where some of the most exciting um, initiatives are going on, are when people are really partnering in a comprehensive way in their community. Um, and so that means getting the Chamber of Commerce involved, getting the local hospital involved, getting um, uh, multiple different types and uh, sectors of employers involved. Um, there's, there's a lot of expertise in, the, in these communities. Um, I was a part of a program in a very rural county in uh, North Carolina that brought the, literally the entire county together to, to think about what can we do to affect chronic disease in our community. And they ended up starting their initiative and focusing a lot of attention in the workplace. Um, and for the very reasons you've heard this morning. So um, when these partnerships happen, and there's true commitment from uh, the county health department and from uh, the major employers, um, there's an energy about that. And there's actually more resources to bring to the table. Um, and so it's a multiplier effect. And so I think we heard that in our survey results, and I think that's the reality that's um, playing out in some communities. Um, I, I wouldn't minimize the effect of local hospitals, because they do have a mandate to do um, uh, uh, health promotion and other uh, disease prevention programming, and um, they're not um, unfamiliar with the safety issues uh, with their own workforce usually and others. So I think these kinds of partnership models are really the key to success for moving forward in a resource-limited world. Yeah, I'll add, um, in our program in the Chronic Disease Center, um, training opportunities, technical assistance opportunities, working with employers and others in the community have sure. generally found that once you open their eyes to some of these best practices, they uncover a lot of capacity that they didn't think they had. It's not sufficient to deal with the, the heavy issues that we're talking about today, um, but it is a start and I think bears out what Laura's found in, in her survey work. Um, in doing that, you know, making um, connections to and opportunities for integration, leveraging the work site to already do a lot of the chronic disease prevention health promotion work they're doing, whether it's in cardiovascular health or physical activity and obesity or tobacco cessation, um, you know, they can apply their knowledge and expertise and just need some orientation to how work sites operate are organized, where they can, um, engage and, and uh, get involved uh, with employers, learning how to speak the employer language, uh, understanding their orientation, um, and they can uh, do a lot of good things. I uh, have another question in the room. Hi, I'm Shannon Michael. I'm in the in CDC School Health Branch um, in the Division of Population Health. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I was, in, I was part of a review that was looking at school employee wellness programs and the impact on the health and academic success of students. And of course, I'm sure you all know there's very little research out there. And so, um, Ron, when you were giving that, when you, were, when you had that slide up there about making the case and the you know, return on investment and the health benefit, you know, how do we sell that to school administrators and school superintendents and district level folks when we don't really have the research to show? You're right. Uh, there, there is very little uh, research out there looking at schools at all levels, you know, uh, uh, K through 12, uh, high school, you know, college, there's a little bit, but not a whole lot. Uh, that really has not been a major focus of this kind of research. I, I think the ideal study would be one, and David, I give credit to David Katz for this, is to look at employers that are supporting school programs that target the children and the employees of those, uh, th those schools and comparing that to uh, programs that just focus on, 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 on the employees themselves, the teachers and so forth, or the children or none at all. I think that'd be a very important study and I think there'll be a huge multiplier effect and the funding for that may come from the employer community because they see a gain in terms of educational growth and healthier uh, children but also healthier potential workers in, in their community. I would just add a couple things to that. Teachers, as, as an occupation, have some of the most difficult work of all. The relatively low pay, high levels of stress, long hours, many of them come in on weekends, use their own money for resources. It's a very demanding, high scrutiny, sometimes no, no positive feedback type of work. Uh, and because of that, the health risks and the 
of K through 12 educators is very, very high, both on the safety front and the chronic disease front. Mm -hmm. So it's imperative that we get this right. And that's one of the few areas where there's increasing employment. There's, there's a growing burden because of that combination. So very much like in healthcare, where you intervene in workplace safety and health for hospital workers, you have downside benefits for the safety of patients and their speedier recovery. We believe the same opportunity exists in the education section as well. Thank you. We, we've actually run out of time, but I want to let the people online know that they will receive answers to their questions, even though they weren't we weren't able to post them within the session today. And I'd um, like to take a moment to thank our speakers for an excellent presentation. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next month for CDC Public Health Grand Rounds.